The primary use case of flow spec is to thwart a DDoS attack. So in order to really understand what flow spec does and how it works, you need to take a closer look at DDoS attacks. Maybe you know at a very high level what a DDoS attack is, but have you ever really considered how amplification attacks work? Because this is a large part of what is really implemented in the real world today. Flow spec is all about coordinating between a customer and a service provider a firewall policy that stops a DDoS attack before it enters the service provider network in the first place. So let's take a closer look about how these DDoS attacks work and then how flow spec can be used in order to stop this type of attack. Let's go. So in order to really understand the point of flow spec and the entire style in which it gets implemented, you really have to understand DDoS attacks. And not just the, the generic, like here's the abstract idea of a DDoS attack. You need to understand how they're actually implemented today. And what we're really talking about is amplification attacks. Check this out. We're going to draw it up on the board here. We've got our customer. This is going to be our customer in ASN 65530. They are running some sort of public service or a public server here. Maybe it's a web server. And what's going to happen here is we're going to have some bad hackers in the world. Let me draw my bad hacker again. And they're very happy because they got these evil squinty eyes, right? Because they look like a hacker. And these hackers want to take down this web server. One of the ways that they can do it is just by flooding it with so much traffic that the service provider, the enterprise, or the server itself simply can't handle that traffic. Maybe they are overwhelming the CPU, maybe they are overwhelming RAM, or maybe they are overwhelming the bottleneck itself, the actual pipes of the internet that make this happen. So these bad hackers, what they do is they send out worms, or viruses, or some sort of malware throughout the entire world that affects dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and maybe even hundreds or maybe even thousands of computers and servers throughout the entire world. They call this a botnet. Sometimes each one of these little things is called a bot, or sometimes it's called a zombie. There's a bunch of different names. And then this bad hacker who sits at their major computer that controls the botnet, this is called the command and control center. They control all of these botnets. All of a sudden, what they'll do when they're ready, they will tell these botnets attack. So all of these devices, all of these zombies, start sending in a flood of traffic that comes in through the pipeline and makes its way all the way up to the server and it just overwhelms. You gotta, and I only drew six little boxes here. You gotta imagine this being like hundreds or even thousands of devices that are overwhelming with traffic. This is the generic idea between a distributed denial of service attack. We are denying, or the hacker I should say, is denying this service, this web server from actually being accessed because they're overwhelming its compute resources or its network resources in order to take it down. And sometimes this could last as short as a few seconds or a few minutes or sometimes it could last hours. It's one of those things where if this is a high impact server, you can't just let it sit. You can't just wait for this attack to fizzle out. You got to do something about it. But it gets more sophisticated than that. Check this out. You may be thinking to yourself, well, okay, not a big deal because we could just stop the sort. We could just stop source traffic. We could see where the source of all of these attacks are coming from and shut it down that way. Well, if there's hundreds or thousands of prefixes this is coming from because of the botnet, well, that becomes pretty difficult to do. But beyond that, these little bitty computers, these maybe old computers or outdated computers with not a lot of compute resources to begin with, if they're just sending in maybe a flood of TCP traffic, maybe it's NTP traffic, maybe it's DNS requests or HTTP GET traffics, these are still relatively small packets. And these tiny little computers can't generate even bigger packets needed to choke up the pipe. I mean, now we're talking in an age of 100 gig links, right? And we're talking, you know, this web server may have something like 24 CPUs and 128 gigs of RAM. It may be hard for this botnet to choke this up. So what this botnet needs to do is it needs to leverage all of these zombies to perform an amplification attack. Here's how an amplification attack really works. Pretend for a moment that we have our hacker one more time. He's a bad guy. And now the hacker has created a web server, maybe an API server. The idea now is that with the botnet, what's going to happen is he'll use the botnet, he or she, I should say, will use the botnet to make a basic HTTP GET request. This request is very, very, very small, but maybe it's requesting a specific subset of data. 
and maybe the response, maybe all of this data that would come back from this web server could result in a response as big as 10 megabytes. So in a typical request, the bot, let's say zombie here, makes a request and then the server would reply to it with this 10 megs of data, right? So far we're following along. However, we don't want the 10 megs of data to go back to the bot. We want, or I should say the hacker again, wants that data to go to the server. So what the zombie does, the zombie spoofs the web server's address. So when the zombie sends the HTTP GET request, it'll be sourced from the target web server's address. That way this web server replies sending that 10 megs of data all the way back to the web server. Now extrapolate that times all of the zombies in my botnet. Now all of these devices are making tiny little requests to our pre-built web server with all of this data. And this web server is replying through the internet targeting this web service for the customer. And all of a sudden, the pipe is now choked up with these huge response payloads. And this web server is stuck having to process each one of these responses through this huge response payload. This is the idea behind an amplification attack. And many different protocols can be leveraged in a, 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 an amplification attack. We've just illustrated how the HTTP protocol can be used with an amplification attack. The hacker sets up a pre-built web server that's going to be replying with a huge payload. But the same thing can go with a DNS request. The hacker doesn't even have to set up anything then. We could tell our zombies to simply make a DNS lookup for a large DNS record to something like Google's DNS server, 8888. We know that DNS server has plenty of compute resources to handle a flood of requests. So maybe the zombies make a DNS request to 8888, but again, spoofing that web server's address. And now all of a sudden we're using Google's resources to piggyback and then send that flood of responses destined for the web server with a much larger payload. The same thing even goes with NTP. There is a portion of NTP that shows the previous NTP servers that have been accessed or NTP clients that have made requests. So all of a sudden we can send an NTP query to an NTP server, again spoofing the address, and then that large payload with all of the previous servers and previous client service are now getting sent towards that web server. This is an amplification attack and this is one of the more common ways that you see it being implemented today. The kicker here is let's let's pick on that HTTP server, that HTTP web server amplification attack one more time. With a zombie making one simple request, the zombie's destination port in this case is port 80, isn't it? And since we're spoofing the source address of the web server up here, the HTTP server, the bad HTTP server, will be responding towards the target web server and the HTTP server's source port is going to be 80. So the idea with BGP flow spec looks like this. We want the customer to identify, wait a minute, we are under a DDoS attack and we need this DDoS attack to be stopped not only at our perimeter, but even our service provider's perimeter because this is impacting our entire service provider and our allocated bandwidth and services at this point. So with BGP flow spec, what happens here is we can use BGP and our BGP peering relationship to our service provider to generate a firewall filter or a firewall policy. In other vendors, they call this an ACL. The customer identifies exactly what they say. Hey, service provider, when you see traffic destined for our web server and the source port is port 80, and maybe we'll even inspect further, making sure this is the TCP protocol, then we want you to discard any traffic on your perimeter. So VMX8 here will be the one that generates this flow spec policy and sends it over BGP down to VMX1. VMX1 is gonna go through a set of validation rules to make sure this is exactly what we wanna do before it propagates the policy down to all of its edge devices. And these edge devices that sit on the edge of our network now implement a firewall filter that stops the exact traffic that our customer implemented. So now this hack is stopped right here at ASN 400 because VMX3 will now have a firewall filter that says, hey, if I receive traffic destined for this prefix, this exact web server itself sourced from port 80, and it's the TCP protocol, we know that we want to stop this traffic because our customer is signaling to us that we have a DDoS attack underway. Now, some spoilers, some things that you need to know right now. 
This is a complicated deployment. There are a lot of coordination and negotiation that needs to take place by default. This isn't something that you enable for every customer by default. We need to make sure the customer knows, hey, if we're going to turn on flow spec for you, these are the rules that we're going to have. So a lot of negotiation needs to take place because we're allowing our customer to implement policies that affect the flow of traffic within our own service provider environment. Now, the good thing is, is this is a BGP RFC standard. There are some validation rules that are already in place so that the customer can't just implement any firewall filter that they want. There's going to be a set of validation rules that we're going to be talking about. But we also need to take some things into our own hands as a service provider and make sure this all checks out. So throughout the rest of these videos, we are going to be taking a look at this from the perspective of both the customer, because they are going to be the one creating the policy and then sending it over BGP, as well as from the perspective of the service provider, because they're the ones who are going to be receiving the policy, validating the policy, and then forwarding it on to the edge perimeter devices within our environment. Then, we're, of course, we're going to validate it and then talk about one more nuancy case that may come up, which is when the customer cannot generate the flow spec policy. So this introduces the point of flow spec. The idea is the primary use case of this is that we are going to be creating firewall filters and propagating them throughout the rest of an autonomous system. This could be used primarily to stop DDoS services, but also keep in mind that service providers that just need to generate generate a firewall filter quickly in their environment, they could just use flow spec and internally propagate a firewall filter that way. Instead of having to type a firewall filter on each individual device, we just use flow spec to send it throughout hundreds or thousands of different devices. So this introduces the point of BGP flow spec. In the next nugget, we're going to get started with the basic deployment, the basic ground rules and settings that we need to deploy on all of our devices in order for this to really work. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.